<sighs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Wow, yesterday the stage was all red. I think it was magma. Uh, it was explained to me actually this morning that uh, yesterday was the creation of the earth, and after magma came water, so it's the creation of life. So now you know why it's blue, and yesterday it was red. Um, another thing that, that's been interesting in the past uh, few days, at least, you know, listening to all the pitches, is uh, how we are increasingly convinced that uh, deep tech is potentially a key answer to uh, our sustainability challenges. But equally clear is the fact that it's all about ecosystem changes, you know, uh, in the sense that it's not just one company moving one part of the value chain. Our world has become so optimized, so optimized on legacy technologies, mostly born out of the uh, Second World War, actually, whether it be chemicals from uh, uh, hydrocarbons, whether it be our logistics system, etc., that it feels that if we try to improve one bit, even with the best startup on Earth, there is still all the other bits around that are not moving. So today, in order to really think about this ecosystem problem, we thought about bringing to you a discussion on the transition to sustainable aviation fuels, which is a topic that is far from new. However, I think there's a, a few new things, announcements, a move of the ecosystem, and so we thought about bringing the ecosystem together to have a really transparent, open debate on what it actually takes to move to sustainable aviation fuels. And so that's why today we are very pleased to be uh, joined by uh, some select representatives of this ecosystem. Eric Dabias from Safran. Good afternoon. Thank you, Eric. Eric is a senior executive and vice president in charge of innovation and R&T uh, research and technology at Safran, and so uh, including sustainable aviation fuels. We are also joined by Fatima D'Souza and many other last names, but I only remembered the first. And Fatima is uh, the SVP in charge of sustainability at Air France KLM. Good to have you with us. Uh, we also have, because this is a startup event, Arnaud Pelletier, CEO of uh, French Tech Paris Saclay, with whom we will have the perspective on what can the ecosystem actually do to help the legacy players. Thank you, Arnaud. And we also have Stéphane Thion, uh, SVP uh, at uh, Total Energy, uh, in charge of their sustainable aviation fuel business line. So this is not all of the actors of the ecosystem because it is so much more complex. We didn't have enough seats, but still, it's a pretty good representative batch. So first of all, we're going to start with a, a, a question to you, Eric, because you, you just came out of your capital market days. Uh, for Safran, so thank you for doing this uh, just after, it must be pretty tough. And uh, sustainability and actually decarbonation uh, of the uh, aviation industry, I think, is really at the center of Safran's strategy. So we wanted to take first a few minutes to listen to you. Uh, maybe help us reposition what it means to decarbonate aviation, really, beyond the hype and be beyond the simplification sometimes we hear, and also help us understand um, why SAF, we will use SAF for sustainable aviation fuels, why SAF is probably one of the biggest levers in the short to midterm. So please, Eric. Thank you, Jérôme. Just maybe to help uh, setting the scene on the subject, uh, I can share with you uh, a select extract of what we presented just yesterday, as you mentioned during our uh, Capital Markets Day. So my Capital Markets Day for us means uh, the encounter of Safran with the investors community, the financial analyst community. I, I'm just pinpointing the fact that this was presented yesterday just to remind that you will see things on these charts, but you know that in this kind of event, when you're displaying something, it's not just words on a chart. It means commitments. It's taken as commitments, and it's not just words, it's action plans behind this. So where do we stand on the subject of uh, climate change challenge in the aviation? And this is not just peculiar to Safran, which is, uh, as you may know, 
an equipment manufacturer for the aerospace business. We are not an air framer, but we are supplying almost everything you may want to find on board an aircraft, from engines to nacelles to landing gears and even the interiors. So this is the passenger experience, because now we, we manufacture seats, we manufacture cabin equipments and so on, things that you as a passenger can touch, feel, and live with. Uh, so where do we stand in this subject? The aerospace community today, not just the industrialists, but the full community, decided to take a global worldwide commitment uh, as early as a few years ago, but this was clearly reinforced early October during uh, the annual uh, general meeting of the IATA. The IATA is uh, the, the association of uh, air transportation actors worldwide. We decided to take the commitment that by 2050, air transportation would be net zero in carbon emission as compared to today. So this is more or less what you can see on this chart. Uh, the situation of aviation before, uh, before uh, the, especially the COVID crisis was something like 2.5% of the total uh, CO2 equivalent emission of human activities worldwide. And this amounts to something like a little bit less than uh, uh, one gigaton of equivalent CO2 per year. So what we are doing is coming from this 1,000 down to zero by 2050. Why? Because this curve, so the lowest of the, what you can see here, is the way for aviation to cope with the Paris COP16 commitment uh, versus the climate change maximum 1.5 degree increase by 2100. So that's definitely the contribution of the aviation sector for this. What is very in interesting is to compare this commitment with what would happen if nothing was done. Mm -hmm. And if nothing was done, this is basically the upper of the curves that you can see on the chart. So this tells you what the challenge is. And it's not just an intent. We have action plans for this. This means that we have ways and means to do so. What does it consist of? Basically, I would say three main levers. One is about technology. Uh, if we stick, uh, okay, come back sure. to it. So the blue part of it is how disruptive technology everywhere on, a, on an aircraft, to make it simple, mm -hmm can help reduce the fuel burn of an aircraft. Uh, lower consumption of the engines, but also a lighter aircraft. So that the lighter the aircraft, you can imagine, the smaller the engine to propel it. The, the red slide, the small red slide, is an additional lever consisting in trying to find a way to better optimize the trajectories of aircraft, especially uh, with uh, air traffic management better optimized and so on to reduce uh, the spillage uh, during the operation. And the third lever, the green one, is substituting the current fossil fuels with SAFs, with hydrogen, with low carbon emitting fuels. What is very interesting in this, uh, maybe you can find in the literature slight differences in the proportions of this blue, red, and green contribution, but all in all, that's that's, the, in a nutshell, the right proportions. And when you see this, you say, wow, for the players in this sector, OE manufacturers, aircraft manufacturers, airlines, uh, the technology does not exclude the SAP. The SAP can't be sufficient to cope with the goal. So it's not we have to work on the technologies or we have to adopt the SAF approach. It's and. So we have to complement. So just to touch base and compare with what, what this goes into when we are looking at what a player like Safran is doing on the next slide, for instance, this turns into an action plan with priorities. For us, what are we doing? We are designing, producing, and delivering equipment that have a carbon footprint on the aircraft. What's the way to do it for us? First, the technology lever, deliver the, the technology for ultra-efficient aircraft at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. This means ultra-efficient means 
as low weight as possible for the components we are supplying, and also disrupt the level of consumption of our engines, because we are a big engine manufacturer. And that's it. Ultra efficiency, we drop down the need for consumption. But the second lever is enable the transition from current fuels, current aviation fuel, to alternative fuel, low carbon fuels, at the same level as the priority for the war. And hybrid and electric propulsion is also a way to substitute the consumption of current fuel by an alternative energy source. So all this is extremely consistent with the level of challenges we have. And on top of that, I shall mention another reason why it's not either technology or SAF, but technologies and SAF. You can just imagine that the more we progress on the technology, the more we reduce the need for the fuel, irrespective of the type of fuel it is. So working on ultra efficiency of the aircraft, it's a clear priority. It's a no regret choice because this way it gives also a better chance for the SAF production to reach uh, the demand that is necessary for aviation. And we are working to make it happen that aviation can continue to grow at the pace that the, the evolution of the world is requiring. So that's really what is driving the community of aviation. I'm a little bit the spokesperson of the full community and not just the <laughs> OE uh, speaker. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Eric. And um, we, we can maybe turn off the, the slides now for everyone. Thank you. Because uh, th thanks for, for making the point that it's not or, it seems to really be an end, that it's about efficiency and frugality, uh, as the French would say, for, for the airplane. But then it's also about really moving towards uh, SAF, as you said, uh, as a short to, to midterm lever. But, and, and now I'm going to play the moderator, and I hope no one will mind, because I might try to ask a few uh, tough questions. Um, it's true that it's, it's, it's only recently that we've, uh, we've heard big players like Safran, like Airbus, other, start to make announcements about whether it be hydrogen, whether it be SAF, etc. So it seems new in a way, and, and also quite recently uh, in the audience, many probably know, for the very first time, there have been some announcement and regulation also following uh, COP26, etc., that there would be some set percentages of minimum amounts of SAF, uh, which are still in, in, in the percents or tens of percents, but are still a, a world premiere in a way. Yet at the same time, uh, one could say uh, SAF is nothing new under the sun, or at least uh, the topic has been here for a long while, uh, in the sense that for a long time, we've been stuck also in a chicken and a egg problem of, uh, yes, if it were inexpensive, of course, uh, Air France, KLM, uh, all the operators would go on it, but uh, it's not, so you don't do. Uh, but then, because you don't do it, it's too expensive for the uh, energeticians. And so you don't produce, and uh, you don't produce, there is not enough supply, so the costs are high, and you have uncertainty on the investment. And because of all this, for you, it's also tough to decide whether you're going to put up what is literally billions in terms of R&T cost. You didn't mention it, Eric, but I think it's in the order of magnitude of 30 30 plus percent of your investment which are going well, into well, this topic. Just to give you a figure, uh, for a group like Safran, we have decided to uh, dedicate 3 billion euros in the coming five years of our own money. It's yes. self-funding for our research and technology program, all in all, and three-fourths of these 3 billion are directly dedicated to decarbonization of aviation. Yeah, so, so we, we see the, the sheer magnitude uh, uh, of the effort. Uh, and so this leads me to my first question. Uh, is this for real? Uh, are, are we actually, do you think, around this table that this is going to move the needle sufficiently? Um, and maybe we'll start asking the question on behalf of the, uh, of the airlines, Fatima, la ladies first. Do, do, do you think it's, first of all, is it for real? And second, is it enough? Or I could say it another way. If Greta were with us, would she say blah, blah, blah? Or would she be happy, you think, with the kind of announcements we are making on SAF? Thank you for that question. You're very and, uh, first of all, thank you for the excellent introduction on the 2050 uh, roadmap, which 
looks pretty much the same for Air France KLM. Indeed, we have committed to be uh, net zero by 2050. And I think importantly also, we are committed to science-based targets, which means that we also want to look at 2030, 2035, uh, thinking of Greta there. Um, so is it enough? Interestingly, our first test flight with SAF was already in 2009. So indeed, we saw the importance uh, of uh, sustainable aviation fuels in an early stage. But uh, happy that I, we're here all together. This is definitely something that one player cannot do alone. We need the entire ecosystem of aviation, but also regulators helping on all possible sides and also you startups, we need you as well. Um, only together can we make this move and I think the momentum is there. Yes, I'm very happy with the fact that we now have these mandates in Europe. Uh, this is accompanied by a system in North America where we're seeing subsidies, different approach, the idea is the same. Let's break through what needs to happen. Let's accelerate what needs to happen. But why is it so important? Um, I think we already touched briefly on uh, the new aircraft of the future, and we have been seeing some uh, keynote speeches today. Every aircraft that arrives today, as we speak, already is 20 to 25% more fuel efficient than the previous generation of aircraft that we have been using. So that alone is already making a big difference. But it's not enough. We know that new technologies are going to come. We have seen elect electric planes, hydrogen planes. But electric planes, maybe 2035, I've been told I'm very optimistic about this, maybe 100 seaters, a range of about 1,500 kilometers. This is mostly a solution for regional flights. Hydrogen, we know that there are many uh, technology issues that still need to be solved given the uh, bigger volume, uh, bigger weight, but I'm sure uh, my colleague on the left here uh, can, uh, can explain a little bit more, uh, Stefan. Uh, you need all types of new technology compressors to make it happen, so 2045, 2050. This too will not be available for long haul flying. So two issues, uh, it's not coming very quickly, even if we speed up. Um, and it will never be a solution for the long haul. So we need sustainable aviation fuels. It is a technology that can be used on existing airplanes. It's drop-in, it's relatively easy to use. There's another reason why it's so important. As some people will tell me um, it's our behavior. If we start flying less, then we solve the problem. And of course, we welcome uh, responsible consumption in general. Uh, so definitely it's something um, to take into account with every, uh, everything you buy in, uh, in your life. But consider this, in 1990, the flying from Europe and North America was responsible for about 70 to 75% of all travel movements in the world. By 2030, that part will go down to about 40 to 45%. Why? Because in Asia and in Africa and other parts of the world, they will have the same type of mobility that we want and that we have. And they are not going to say, oh, that's okay, you know, in, uh, in certain parts of the world they, they had a good time. And now that same part of the world is going to tell us that we have no access to flying. It's not going to happen. So it is even more important that while there is responsible consumption, let me stress that, that we do find the right technological solutions. And, and I, I mean, and at BCG, I think we, we couldn't agree more in the sense that when we look at the potential of deep tech, we see it as one, if not the lever, to break the compromise between sustainability and profitability, not because we think it's important to make a buck, but because it's the only way we see in the short to medium term to basically be consistent with the continuing development of a lot of the world, to also be able to help transition economies to a sustainable future. And therefore, that means that the kind of actions that you're saying to fund for sustainability and technology and to be able to reinvest, they require to have workable solutions. But then I, I, I turn it back to Eric then, because, okay, Thank you, Air France, you say we're all for it. We still haven't covered the cost part of uh, SAF, but we'll come back. But now on, on, the, um, on the OEM, on the, 
uh, industrial side. Um, okay, you make big investment, but it also sounds, you, you emphasized, Eric, uh, that it was a bit self-funded, huh? so I cut that part. Are you getting enough traction from the overall ecosystem, you know, regulatory, is it enough, or are you missing some things to be able to go all in? Because this technology, in a way, it's not that new, so is it enough, or...? Yeah, uh, the technology has uh, multiple horizons. As Fatima, you said, we are preparing the disruption in technology to make the next leap in terms of uh, uh, fuel efficiency for and so on. And uh, you're right, the accumulation of uh, all te technological bricks that will make the future super efficient aircraft will take a while. Whereas on my first slides, you can see that we can't wait for having the tipping point and, and changing the slope of the curves of the emissions. And that's the reason why the SAF is so important. So on the one hand side, on OE side, we are preparing the next generation. But at the same time, we are maximizing the ability of our pr existing products to burn SAFs. Mm -hmm. Today, there are some limitations. Today, our products, for instance, are already all certified to burn up to a blend of 50% SAF mixed with fossil kerosene, aviation kerosene. It's already technically possible and certified. And we are currently making it possible to remove this 50% to to theoretical you, you, barrier. You I'm, I'm saying theoretical barrier because it it's, uh, has been a, a worldwide standard to, to, to be on the safe side of it. Mm -hmm. But there is no major scientific challenge to make an engine currently 50% compatible up to 100% compatible with SAF. So that's the immediate action we're making. So that we, that's the first way an mm -hmm. OE is fostering, calling mm -hmm. for the adoption of SAF. We are working on removing any theoretical barrier on our current products and even working on the installed fleet. That's extremely important for Fatima because, you know, it's good to say the next generation will be, will be great, will bring the disruption, right? But for the time being, what is flying is an installed fleet inherited from the past. So on this product, if there is a way to make them already 100% compatible with SAP, the benefit can be just tomorrow. And, and, and if I may, Eric, so we, this makes me think of it. Also, if, if I understand you know, that this installed fleet, which can get overhauled, is often passed on to developing economies after it's been... So, so this is also critical, again, to your point, Fatima, if we don't want to hold back other countries in their development to be stuck with, um, you know, stuck with burning legacy fuels. So, okay, that, that point is clear, but we still haven't addressed the elephant in the room, especially since, um, if I remember the numbers, I think if we project um, the uh, demand, even to reach the, the, the last accords, you know, the announcements, uh, I think there is not enough uh, even biomass available to, to reach uh, the levels of demand that theoretically you would be able to, to, to require. And the problem, uh, what this means, because this might sound like an arcane topic, is that you are in a case, if I understood, where the science is there, but maybe the supply is not enough, so we might be stuck in a paradox where actually staff costs increase because more people want them to a point where um, with the low margins of airlines, and maybe uh, this is something where from an energetician point of view, uh, Stefan can tell us a bit more. Uh, there is not just one kind of SAF, there are different kinds of SAF, and they present challenges in terms of supply and demand. So can you tell us a bit about it? Yes, sure, thank you very much. Um, it's kind of the chicken and the egg. Again. Uh, <laughs> again, where at the end of the day, those sustainable aviation fuel will be more expensive and are and will continue to be more expensive than the fossil jet fuel as we know it today in the environment we know it today. Uh, to define sustainable aviation fuel in simple ways, it's a combination of feedstocks and technologies that have different maturity. The feedstocks can be either from a, a bio source like uh, used cooking oil, animal fat, uh, waste, agricultural waste or, or wood waste, for example. Uh, or they can be um, electro, uh, like uh, from renewable energy, and I will get into the pathways to get to a liquid fuel. But so bio or e, 
electro. And then you have technologies with different maturity. The one that is, and we can kind of classify them in three different buckets. The first one is the bucket of the ones that are commercial today, and it's a technology called HEFA. It's the conversion of fused cooking oil and animal fat into sustainable aviation fuel with a hydro treatment type of technology. And we have some capacities today, they're limited. Uh, there's tens of thousands of tons uh, of sustainable aviation fuel uh, produced today with this technology. Uh, the advantage of this technology is, is kind of the cheapest of all. Uh, it has the ability also to, for uh, energy company like ours to do a retrofit of existing refinery and turn them into biorefinery, so it uh, uh, use minimal capex. Uh, the, the challenge is the accessibility of the feedstocks, those used cooking oil and those animal fats are limited in, in, in volume and in availability. And they are today used for over industry like the road industry, the renewable diesel and biodiesel uh, today are using those types of feedstocks as well. So there is a competition between the use of the feedstock into uh, those industry, the road, the aviation, and soon to be the marine also and the shipping industry. And then you have a second bucket uh, that is uh, actually technologies that are under, under demonstration. Uh, those are the alcohol to jet and the gasification fisher trap. To make it simple, it's using feedstocks that are more widely available, uh, but it has some challenges because the collection of the feedstocks might not be uh, as easy. Uh, it calls for a, a more decentralized system, so you're talking about smaller units that have uh, a bit of a less yield of conversion from feedstocks to sustainable aviation fuel molecules. So you cannot get really the economy of scale of building very, very uh, large facilities. And then the third bucket, and that's the holy grail, that the one that everybody's talking about, uh, that those are the electrofuel, the e-jet or the e-saf. And that's the conversion of renewable electricity uh, produced from photovoltaic, solar, or uh, wind power into hydrogen, so a green hydrogen. And you combine this green hydrogen with a source of carbon, uh, either direct air capture, carbon that is in the atmosphere, or fatal carbon that is uh, emitted by uh, uh, steel mills, for example, or cement trees, and you combine those molecules together to produce an e-jet. And the advantage of this is that you have kind of an unlimited resource of feedstock, electricity, or renewable electricity, and carbon. Uh, so in that sense, sky is the limit when it comes to the e-jet. But what's particular about all those are the fact that they are more expensive than the jet fossil. And that's why, one of the reasons why those sustainable aviation fuel capacities, we haven't seen great developments in the, next, in the last 10 years. Yes, Air France and, and, and over airlines have been using SAF for uh, over a decade, but in very small and limited quantities. So in the last well, let's say 18 months, we've seen an increase of announcement of new capacities for sustainable aviation fuel. And I think it's you know, due to all the upcoming legislation, we talked about the incentives in the US uh, where you get rewarded for incorporating sustainable aviation fuel and there is a, a premium, an environmental premium to putting that on the market. In, in Europe, a bit less pragmatic, we're more on the the stick, it's a mandate. If you don't put sustainable aviation fuel, you'll get the penalty. But thanks to those uh, legislation, we start seeing more visibility on the needs of the molecule. And for company like ours, it gives comfort in investing into new capacities. Mm -hmm. And to give things in perspective, I said earlier, there's probably you know, 50,000 tons of fuels that have been used uh, uh, of sustainable aviation fuel used uh, last year uh, in a market that, in a normal market, 2019, was 320 million tons of jet consumed in the world. So it's, it's a drop in the bucket. And, and Stefan, but if you allow me to, to interrupt you, because I said I would ask some not so nice questions sometimes. So, uh, <laughs> so just warning. Uh, I, 
I, I understand that some of that use cooking or etc. On, on top of being in limited supply, it, it's also something we have to import, for example, outside of Europe. Sources yes, might indeed. be in the USA, they could be in Asia. Yes. So, so there's, um, okay, we go from chicken and egg to I don't know what word I am allowed to use when, when we are in this situation, you know? So what, what kind of fuel are we going to use to transport the feedstock might be a second order question. And, and, and so you, you mentioned uh, moving to decentralized, maybe more localized production. I also understood the Sinfion, it seems very hyped up, but it's also a bit long term. So in the current time, uh, what does it mean, alternative feedstocks? Uh, what is, are, are they even legal? Um, so be, because I think we are very constrained in Europe in terms of what we can use. And uh, I'd like also for us to think about, uh, is there room for innovation to help a, a, a company like Total Energy or, or Safran, and we'll transition to that, to actually capture this challenge, to be more explicit. I, I think our economies have been used to massive economies of scale, big plants, huh, et cetera. Yes. And yes. so uh, we make a lower cost by having big plants. If we move to nature-driven supply small plants, Yes. Can you do it? What can the ecosystem bring to you? I think that that's pretty interesting. Yeah, so the low hanging fruit, like I said earlier, those those large announcement capacities of turning those used cooking oils coming from Asia, or those animal fat mostly coming from the United States into sustainable aviation fuel. The future of SAF will reside in smaller scale uh, decentralized facilities that are more in line with the circular economy concept. You use local feedstocks uh, at a radius that is maybe 100, 150 kilometers, because those feedstock will not travel very well, and you convert them, and, and it's gonna be, you know, it, and, and the yield of those future technology are lower as well. So one of the things, one of the lever to reduce the cost of those solution is actually increasing the yield of conversion of those feedstocks into sustainable can, can aviation fuel. Can you give fuel. an example of, of those feedstocks so for everyone? Yeah. So in terms of yield, uh, and it's well also one of the reasons the, the early adopter of, of, the, of the technology, the hydro treatment, the one that is commercial today, uh, the yield conversion is about uh, 58, 60%. So for one ton of feedstock, you turn 60% of it in sustainable aviation fuel. For those less mature technology that they are in demonstration mode, you're more in the 15 to 25 percent. So uh, it, it, it's a challenge. And as you increase the yield, you lower the, the cost of producing those molecules. So there is a lot of work that is being done in trying to in, you know, make, make those, those process more efficient. Uh, okay. So that's, that's one lever. And I, I, when we were preparing this discussion, I think you mentioned to me how some of this feedstock could actually come from um, some uh, agriculture, some crops, not fit for human consumption, because uh, also I think for companies like Air France, it's clearly part, yeah, you're saying no, it's like nope. av av aviation will not compete against agri food, and, and this would be counter to the climate needs and, and biodiversity. But on the other hand, if you were able to use, for example, crops that can regenerate the fields between yes. staple crops, then this is also you know, revenue for agriculture, uh, for yes, farmers, so, etc. So there are soils today that are contaminated and that cannot be used for agriculture for the purpose of feeding the human, the human being. So you could actually take those soil and, and grow crops, and because they're not meant to consumption, you could utilize them to make fuel. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is in agriculture, you could use what we call interculture. So in between growing crops, you have to uh, let the, the field go for a few months. You could actually grow crops that are normally not, you know, you, you're not supposed to grow those crops. They're not supposed to go for human, human feed. So therefore you could use those and, and increase the, 
the, the, the, the, the types of feedstocks to make those first, you know, first generation types of fuel and in and a sustainable way. Exactly. And what's interesting, as you say this, is um, you know, one can imagine the challenges that used to be more around organic chemistry, uh, you know, refinery, etc. Suddenly, we are now in the realm of synthetic biology. Mm -hmm. we're, we're in the realm probably of uh, nanoscale membranes, new extraction technologies, new thinking about logistics and supply chains. So yes. um, well, maybe you want to come, but I was thinking since we have a representative of the uh, startup ecosystem with Arnaud, uh, also as we were preparing this, um, I think we were struck by the fact that in, 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 uh, in actuality, the uh, aviation industry requires more, sorry, I'm going to say something naive, than um, um, specialized people in turbines. You know, it sounds like there's a, a new field that is opening up around decarbonation for all kinds of ventures, and, and also potentially, Eric, I think you'll talk about the investment side just afterwards. We'll close on that. Can you tell us a bit, Ar Arnaud, about what, what you think of the room open for the ecosystem? Yeah, um, yes, I would like to uh, mention three points uh, very briefly uh, that are very linked to the three levers you mentioned uh, earlier. Um, I, I will make a very easy statement to, to start. I would say uh, maybe the most sustainable fuel is the one we don't burn. Uh, and I think this is the operation optimization you were mentioning uh, earlier. Uh, I think this is uh, something ready. Uh, there are a lot of startups, uh, just as an example, a lot of start startups working on uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, to improve uh, whatever traje trajectories uh, the uh, ground operations uh, uh, and, and to help to uh, uh, have this uh, uh, fuel uh, uh, consumption reduction. Uh, so, so this is one, one, uh, one key example and I think uh, startups could directly work right now with the operators on that specific topic. Um, my second point is uh, specifically on SAF. Um, we see uh, startups working uh, to develop new process or improve ex existing processes that could be uh, put at scale after uh, with uh, uh, companies like you. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, cryogenic solutions that are used for gas separation or uh, uh, um, uh, to, to obtain uh, um, liquefaction from gas uh, to, to store and uh, um, I think we have to mention also about hydrogen, and you did it just before, uh, saying that biofuel, uh, because we have uh, obvious limitation of biomass, uh, we, would have, we, we would have to go to uh, thin fuel, and hydrogen could be a, a good option uh, in combination with, with CO2. Uh, here, again, we see a lot of startups uh, working on uh, green hydrogen production uh, that could really bring something to the industry. Um, Hydrogen could be used uh, as, as a source of fuel. It could be burned as, as it is. Uh, it could also be used to uh, produce electricity. And it, then I come to my third point, uh, electrification. Um, I think uh, we all agree, and you mentioned that earlier, that uh, we're not going to see uh, wide body aircraft tomorrow uh, full electric. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of startups, hundreds of startups worldwide, uh, working on full electrical uh, aircraft. Uh, I think these guys as a, are the new uh, pioneers. Uh, they're going to change the game. They're going to bring new technologi technologi um, te technological uh, uh, bricks uh, that could be used maybe in a few decades uh, um, in, in uh, the next generation. But also they are changing the way uh, we, we travel. Uh, maybe the only way to travel is not going to be uh, traveling uh, and, and carrying hundreds of people between big cities uh, and as uh, you mentioned that maybe some some space for uh, regional uh, uh, connections uh, with lighter aircraft giving the opportunity to uh, to bring new uh, technology uh, available soon so so clearly the field I'm, again for startups and investors that are present is very big from your perspective and, and you act as a go-between between, between with large corporates and the ecosystem. Maybe we have just one minute left, a final one, maybe uh, Eric, from your perspective, how open are you to those kind of collaborations? How to engage with the likes of Safran? Yeah. Uh, we are engaging for the technological part of it uh, with the startups that help us 
that complement our research and technology to accelerate the pace of innovation in the technology. We have many examples. Uh, working this way is a way for us especially to demonstrate in a much faster way on, on uh, objects some incremental or disruptive technology bricks that we could not otherwise develop so fast. That's the first part. But just a comment. You know, the aerospace business is very often a niche market when you compare with mass production industries like mm -hmm. the automotive and so on. If I move back to the SAF subject, what is at stake here is upscaling with huge volumes at the end of the day that will be necessary to make it happen in terms of decarbonization. So I think that for the ecosystem of startups, as the, the, the history is not written today, you mentioned, Stefan, there are many pathways to produce the ultimate fuels we will have to use. And at the same time, we will not afford in this industry to have various grades of the final product uh, depending on the region it has to be produced because aviation is just worldwide. A jet is flying today in the US, next day it's in Singapore, next day it's in Dubai, the day after it's in Paris or London. So it, it means that we need to upscale the future solution that has to be worldwide in terms of potential market. It's fascinating and quite different from what can be experienced. So there is really a, a well of wealth that can be captured finding the, the, the best possible pathways. And I think that in this moment, in the, at this point of time, probably it's interesting to capture as much as possible the good ideas of startups that complement the good ideas of the energy producers and so on to find the ways and means to just accelerate it. Because it's all about the pace of this innovation and the, uh, the, the way to make it happen in terms of upscaling for SAF. Thank, thank you, Eric. And, and just to finish on a Cocorico note, it's because I can see the little logo. Um, I, I think we're fortunate to have a giant uh, of this ecosystem present here today. So wh what I take away from your message is that if in the ecosystem, whether it's investors, wh whether it's startups, you manage to connect with these folks, develop part of the solution, to what is bound to be a global problem. You're not developing just fuels for Air France or for Airbus, etc. You are de facto doing something which is good for the whole world. And so uh, I think it's a global call for action that we're making for everyone. And um, I think we all look forward to hearing your ideas as well. Thank you.